Chapter 32 Nahri You're a good Banu Nahida. Nasreen's words from the other night rang in Nahri's mind as she stared at the sink. A good Banu Nahida. The shock in her mentor's face, the way the spark, the jesting and the weary patience, everything that had made her Nisreen had vanished from her dark eyes. The hands that had guided Nahri's, now growing cold in the quiet of the Grand Temple. You need a break. Subha's voice yanked her from her thoughts. She threw a towel at Nahri. You could have washed your hands a hundred times for how long you've been standing here staring at the water. Nahri shook her head, drying her hands and retying her apron. I'm fine. I'm not asking. Nahari glanced at the other doctor, startled, and saw only determination in her eyes. You wished to work with another healer? Fine, then I'm acting on behalf of our patients. You are not fit to treat anyone right now. Before Nahari could protest, the doctor took her by the arm all but depositing her in a low couch. A cup of tea and platter of food waited on a nearby table. Subha nodded to it. The camp workers have been bringing food and clothing by. They thought your people could use it. The gesture moved her. That was kind she said softly. She picked up the tea, too weary to resist, and took a sip. Subha sat beside her. She sighed, wiping a line of ash from her sweat-streaked brow. If I've not said it yet, I'm terribly sorry. She shook her head. I spoke a bit with Lady Nasreen last night. A small smile played on her lips. It was only slightly confrontational. In all, she seemed very capable and quite kind. Nahari stared at her tea. She taught me everything I know about the Nahid sciences. Emotion rose in her voice. She was the closest thing to family I had in Devabad, and I couldn't save her. Subha touched her hand. Don't lose yourself in what you might have done for a patient, especially not one you loved. She cleared her throat. Trust that I speak from experience. After my father, I felt useless. I wasted weeks on self-pity and grief. You don't have weeks. Your people need you now. Mahri nodded, finding relief in the direct words. They were certainly more useful than weeping on Ollie's shoulder in the garden. A weakness. That's what Nasreen had called Ollie, and clearly she'd been right. Had Nahri been the Banu Nahida her people needed, she would have forced the name of that informant from Ollie's lips. Banu Nahida? A familiar voice called from the knot of people bustling about the entrance to the exam chamber. 
Jamshid. Someone must have given him a shirt, but it was covered in blood and ash, and he looked as exhausted as Nahri felt. His gaze fell on hers, and then he was across the room in seconds with such swift agility that Nahri nearly dropped her teacup. Forget the burns, Jamshid wasn't even limping. Jamshid? She gaped, looking him up and down. Closer now, she could see he was trembling, his eyes bright with barely checked panic. Subha frowned. Nahri said you were struck with roomy fire and badly burned. She rose to her feet, reaching for him. Would you like us to- He jerked back. I'm fine, he said hoarsely. Quite, quite fine, he added, sounding slightly hysterical. How are you? Nahari stared at him. He certainly didn't sound fine. We're doing what we can, she replied. Are they finished at the procession site? Jamshid nodded. The final count is 86 dead, he said softly. Muntadir and the king were leaving when I did. They only found the three attackers. Nearly a hundred people dead at the hands of three? Nahri put down her tea, her hands shaking. I don't understand how this could happen. It never has before. Jamshid said, his voice sorrowful. I don't think anyone expected anything like this. Nahri shook her head. I'm glad to have been present when Devabad's people discovered a new low in slaughtering one another. Jamshid stepped closer, laying a hand on her shoulder. I'm so sorry about Nasreen Nahri. He blinked back tears. I can't even really believe it. It's difficult to imagine returning to the infirmary and not seeing her there. Nahri struggled to keep her voice from thickening. We'll have to manage. Our people need us, he flushed. You're right, of course, but Nahri, if things are under control here, do you have a minute to talk? Alone, he clarified, nodding to the corridor. Of course, Nahri stood. If you'll excuse me, Dr. Sen. The moment they were outside, Jamshid whirled on her. Nahri, are you sure it was roomy fire in those containers? Nahri was as taken aback by the question as she was by the fear in his eyes. Yes? I mean... What else could have burned like that? He was wringing his hands. Do you think there could have been anything else in it? Some sort of, I don't know, healing serum? She blinked. Because of your back? In the chaos of the attack and Nasreen's death, Nahri had hardly given thought to how swiftly Jamshid's burns had vanished. He'd gone pale. No, not just because of my back. 
His mouth opened and closed as if he was struggling for words. Nahri, you're going to think I'm mad, but... Banu Nahida! It was Razu this time. You need to come quickly, she said, switching to Takaristani. This one's father is throwing a fit outside. Jamshid spun on Razu. Then tell him to wait. The words had no sooner left Jamshid's lips than he gasped, clapping a hand over his mouth. Nahri's eyes went wide. He'd just spoken in a perfect imitation of Razu's ancient dialect of Tukaristani, a language she'd heard not a soul save Razu and herself speak. Jamshid, how did you- Jamshid. Kave came racing into the corridor. Banu Nahida, come, there's no time to waste. Jamshid still looked too astonished to speak, so Nahri did. What's going on? Kave was pale. It's the Amir. Jamshid was in full panic as they galloped toward the Madan. Whatever he'd been trying to tell her clearly gone from his mind. What do you mean he collapsed? He demanded of Kave again, shouting over the clatter of hooves. I am telling you all that I know, Kave replied. He wanted to stop and visit with survivors outside the Grand Temple, and then he passed out. We brought him inside, and I came for you as soon as I could. Nahri tightened her legs around her horse, clutching the reins as the Gaziri quarter passed by in a blur. Why would you not bring him to the infirmary or the hospital? I'm sorry, we weren't thinking. They passed through the Gaziri gate. The Madan was eerie in its emptiness, like many of the streets had been, glowing faintly in the deepening night. It should have been filled with celebrations, with devas who'd had a bit too much plum beer dancing on the fountains and children conjuring fireworks. Instead, it was entirely still, the smell of burned flesh and smoke hanging on the dusty air. A handcart selling delicate garlands of blown glass flowers lay abandoned on its side. Nari feared there was a good chance its owner lay under one of the 86 blood-soaked shrouds outside the temple. The sound of chanting suddenly drew her ear. Nahri raised a hand, slowing her horse. It was the sing-song intonation of the call to prayer. Except Isha prayer had already been called. It wasn't in Arabic either, she realized. Is that... Gizaria? Jamshid whispered. Why would the Muezzins be calling in Gizaria? And why now? Kave had grown paler. I think we should get to the temple. He spurred his horse toward the Deva Gate the two Shedu statues throwing bizarre shadows against the Madan's copper walls. They hadn't gotten halfway across when a line of horsemen moved to intercept them. Grand Wazir, a man called. 
Stop. The Ka Ed, Nari realized, recognizing him. Six members of the Royal Guard stood with him, armed with scythes and Zulfikars, and as Nari watched, another four archers stepped out from the other gates. Their bows were not yet drawn, but a whisper of fear went through her anyway. What is the meaning of this? she demanded. Let us pass. I need to get to the Grand Temple and make sure my husband is still breathing. Wajed frowned. Your husband is nowhere near the Grand Temple. Amir Muntadir is at the palace. I saw him just before we left. Jamshid pushed forward on his horse, seemingly heedless of the way the soldiers instantly moved their hands to their blades. Is he all right? My father said he had taken ill at the Grand Temple. Baffled confusion on Wajed's face and a flush of guilt on Kaveh's were all Nahri needed. Did you lie to us? she demanded, whirling on the Grand Wazir. Why in God's name would you do such a thing? Kaveh shrank back, looking ashamed. I'm sorry, he said hurriedly. I needed to get you to safety, and Muntadir was the only way I could think of to get you both to leave the hospital. Jamshid drew up, looking shocked and wounded. How could you let me think he was hurt? I'm sorry, my son. I had no- Wajed interrupted. It doesn't matter. None of you will be going to the Grand Temple. I have orders to have the two of you escorted to the palace he said with a nod to Kave and Nahri. He hesitated, looking weary and worn down for a minute, before he continued. Jamshid, you're to come with me. Kave instantly edged in front of his son and Nahri. I beg your pardon? The call came again, haunting waves of Gizaria breaking the tense silence. Wajed stiffened, a muscle working in his face, as if whatever was being said caused him pain. He wasn't the only one. Half the men were Gaziri, and they too looked visibly unsettled. One went further. The sole Gaziri archer standing in the frame of the neighboring Tukaristani gate, he shouted something in their language. Wajed returned a terse response. The archer clearly wasn't mollified. He argued back, gesturing at them, and then at the gate that led back to the Shafit neighborhoods. Nahri had no clue as to what he was saying, but it was seeming to resonate. The other Gaziris shifted uncomfortably, a couple darting uncertain glances at each other. Abruptly, the archer threw down his bow. He turned on his heel, but he didn't get far because with a single curt word from Wajed, Another soldier shot him dead. Nahri gasped, and Jamshid drew his sword, instantly moving closer to her. But the Ka Ed wasn't looking at them. He was glaring at his men. That is the penalty for treason, understand? There will be no arrests and no forgiveness. I do not care what you hear. He eyed the soldiers. 
We take commands from only one man in Devabad. What in the creator's name is going on, Wajed? Nahri demanded again. She, Kave, and Jamshid had drawn as close as they could on horseback. You can direct your questions to the king when you see him. Wajed hesitated. Forgive me, Banu Nahida, but I have my orders. He raised a hand, and the rest of the archers drew their bows, their arrows targeted on the devas. Wait, Nari cried. What are you doing? Wajed drew a pair of iron-laced binds from his belt. As I said, the king has requested that you and Kave be taken to him. Jamshid is to come with me. No, Kave sounded desperate. Ghassan isn't taking my son. Not again. Then I have instructions to shoot the three of you dead. Wajed said quietly, starting with the Banu Nahida. Jamshid slid from his saddle. Take me, he said immediately, dropping his sword to the ground. Don't hurt them. No, Wajed, please, I beg you, Kaveh beseeched. Just let him stay with me. We're no threat to you. Surely whatever Ghassan has to say to me and Nahri. I have my orders, Kaveh. Wajed cut in, not ungently. Take him he said to his men, and then glanced at her. And I'd suggest you keep any possible sandstorms to yourself. We're all rather quick with our weapons. He tossed the iron cuffs to her. You'll be putting those on if you care about their lives. Kave lunged for his son. Jamshid, a soldier hit him hard across the back of his skull with the flat of his blade, and Kaveh crumpled to the ground. Baba, Jamshid sprang for his father, but hadn't taken two steps before a pair of men grabbed him, pressing a knife to his throat. Your choice, Banu Nahida. Wajed said. Jamshid's worried gaze darted between his father's slumped form and Nahri. Let them take me, Nahri. Please, I can take care of myself. No. Thinking quickly, she spun back on Wajed. I want to speak to my husband. She insisted. The emir would never permit this. The emir does not command me, Wajed replied. The cuffs, now, he clarified as the knife pressed harder into Jamshid's throat. Nahri cursed under her breath, but slipped them on. The iron burned against her skin, her magic not gone, but deadened. A pair of soldiers instantly descended upon her, binding her wrists tightly so that she couldn't take the cuffs off. Nari glared at Wajed. I will kill your king if you hurt him. I swear it to you, Ka'ed, on my ancestors' ashes. I will kill your king, and then I will kill you. Wajed merely inclined his head. 
Another pair of soldiers was binding Jamshid's hands. I'm going to get you out, she declared. I promise. I'll get word to Mutadir. Jamshid swallowed. Take care of yourself first. Please, Banu Nahida, he shouted as they pulled him away. We need you alive.